Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm excited to talk today about sovereign AI and what that means uh, for Red Panda and, and for you. Uh, my name is Tyler Rockwood. I'm an engineer at Red Panda, and I get the pleasure of working on a lot of this cool um, and cutting edge Gen AI technology. Uh, to get started, we're going to um, real four simple sections to this presentation. We're going to walk through an introduction to generative AI. This is going to be a practitioner's introduction, so don't worry, we're not going to get into the weeds of how neural networks work, um, although that is a fun topic of itself. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit like, who is Red Panda? What is Red Panda? Maybe you do or don't know us. Um, I'll give you a quick intro. We're going to talk about what is sovereign AI? Um, what is the concept of it? How can you use it? And then um, to give you some sort of tangible way to use it is at the end, I'll, I have two different um, demos of using um, Red Panda's latest uh, technology called Red Panda Connect um, to build some of these, some like data streaming pipelines that use sovereign AI um, and use some of these really cool Gen AI uh, technologies in a really easy way. So it'll be fun. I uh, promise stick through, stick through it with me. Um, let's get started. Um, so to start off, we're going to go through, like I said, a this is a practitioner's guide to Gen AI. So this is not the theory. This is not going to be how LLMs work under the hood. Although if you do want to know more, it's a really fascinating topic. Um, if you do want to know more about those, I've got some great links that I've collected over the last, you know, couple of years that I think would, can be helpful if you actually do want to get your hands dirty, maybe build something if you're a builder like myself. Um, or if you're a visual learner, there's some great YouTube videos in there as well of just how these things work. Um, if you want to learn more about the underlying technology, um, both from like a, how does this work? And also from a, like, how do I build these things from scratch? Um, cool. That's all I'll say. So we're going to walk through at a sort of high level as sort of like as a user of Gen AI, what are the different concepts that I need to be aware of? What are the different things that I need to be able to to know about. So we'll, we'll go through there. We're going to start kind of at the beginning, I guess, uh, with word vectors. Um, so this is, uh, there's an old paper, I think old, like 10 ish years ago that talks about this. Um, there's a pretty popular project called word to vec um, I think it's out of Google, um, that basically has this concept of converting words into vectors, which is just like a series of floating point numbers representing the semantic meaning of those words. And the thing about these vectors is that there's there's some core there's some nice properties that you can do do with these vectors that have semantic meaning. For example, um, if I you know add if I have person and I add you know female to it, I'll get woman. Or if I take um, you know uh, royalty and add you know woman to it, I'll get queen. Or if I subtract um, woman from Queen, then I'll get royalty back again, or you know, uh, somewhere approximate in the vector space, similar to that. Um, so that's an important thing to note for embeddings, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but that's that's word vectors. Um, basically, like I said, just a mapping from um, a word to a series of floating point numbers that represent that semantically and what the, what the meaning of that word is. Um, so next, we're going to talk about. We don't actually, when we talk about Gen AI and these sort of like embeddings or these vectors, we don't actually talk about, it's not actually real words that we're um, putting into these models, these, these neural networks. Um, we, we turn in tokens into um, these models and that's sort of the input and the output. And that has some, some implications of like how these models work. But um, I just wanted to call that out because there's a lot of words out there, right? Um, different languages. Um, and things like that. So we don't actually, we're not able to actually represent that full space and put it into our neural network. We need to com compress that space somehow. So we do that into this fixed ID set um, that we call tokens. And each token has an ID, which is just an integer number. Um, and there's a bunch of different strategies of how you do tokenization that actually has implications on the um, quality of the outcoming model. So um, uh, various different types of tokenization. Um, there's a really famous one called sentence piece um, that a lot of Google's models are are trained using. And I believe the Llama, um, Meta's Llama series of models is trained using sentence piece up to Llama 2. And then for Llama 3, um, they used uh, a byte pair encoding. So BPE is how that's usually um, used the acronym for that. Um, and OpenAI, I believe, trains all their models using BPE. 
um, as well. And uh, this is an example of VPE encoding using using OpenAI has a has a, a tool online that you can use and convert words, and you can see the visual representation of how those break down into tokens. Um, and, and the reason why I say these are not really like words, but tokens, is that you can see in this example here of how the the wolf howled at the moon is broken down is howled is actually broken into two different tokens. Uh, and the LLM is part of its um, embedding, computing embeddings and for that encoding pass, we'll, we'll sort of figure out that those are both like the same um, in the context of the sentence and that those are both to like represent the word howled. Um, and and like I said, I'm not gonna dive super deep into how those, um, all this work, all the like low level bits here work, but um, High level thing is there's this tokenization process. There's a bunch of different strategies for that. That takes our, our raw text that we take in and take and converts them into these internal tokens, which then goes to the LLM. And then we get some, some tokens out when we're doing text generation. Um, the other thing, so in the intermediary step, um, this is where those output tokens and the that word vector stuff that I was talking about in that previous slide kind of get get married and go together right is the um we do is we build upon this idea of word vectors and that we start to re represent higher level concept of sentences and passages and what this like overall text means so generally what happens is as you when you start out um, in these models you've done your tokenization process each of those token ids get converted into a embeddings vector which represents just that token, what it means, along with um, usually also the position of that token within the larger um, piece, the larger uh, text is encoded as well. Um, so that then in the process of the neural network running, it can um, defer, like it can figure out what the, give higher layers of meaning to those individual vectors. Um, so as an example here, I have two sentences John picks up a magazine and Susan works for a magazine. Now, magazine, same word, will result in the same tokens um, input to the to the um, neural network, but we'll have very different semantic meanings and the resulting embeddings for magazine will be very different. And that is done. They have this concept of a, con or a concept of a context window. So they will look back when you're during the process of these um, neural networks running, they will look back and look at previous words to figure out uh, the meaning of a particular word. So for magazine, because of the picks up or works for gives different meaning to that word. So it will look back and see, oh, you know, be based on this previous, uh, the previous tokens, this or sorry, the previous embeddings vectors, this embeddings vector looks different. So, an, uh, sorry, I don't know if I explained this, but an embeddings vector is um, just, a, again, a series of floating point numbers um, that we can manipulate and do operations like multiply them or add them in subtraction, and they have like real semantic meaning. Um, so, again, as the uh, this neural network works through and processes these, it's able to pick that up. And that's sort of that embedding that you get at the very end of that process is the embedding that you use for things like a vector database, or if you have a vector index in your existing database, you put that series of floating point numbers in there. And that's, that's the, that can, because these vectors have meaning when you add and um, remove them and the distance between two vectors has meaning of like how closely related something are, you can do similarity search um, using these different, uh, vectors and that's often how uh, the a building block for building something like re retrieval augmented generation or rag which you've probably everybody has heard of hopefully at this point um which we'll show a little bit more of later um so then we'll get into so that's sort of the the embeddings process um tokenization and the basis and then we have the actual process of token generate or of text generation which um behind the scenes what it does is you take your initial text, you break it up into tokens, you run it through your LLM, um, and it uses embeddings to sort of compute the meaning of something. In the end, uh, at the very end, you'll take the last, uh, you know, is in this example, the if that's one token, you'll take that last uh, embedding, and from the embedding of is, you there's um, a computation that will basically give you a 
uh, what's called logits, which are the predict the predict sorry excuse me the um, percentage likelihood of which token is the most likely um, to be in that sequence of of text. So the sky is, and you can see here in this example, this graphic's really helpful. You can see the sky is blue or the sky is clear, and the sky is usually like as as you get um, higher probabilities it's more likely that that word will make, make sense. And that's taken in the, the, the embeddings and been modified by all the prior embeddings in the text. Um, because if there was previous contents that said something around like it was, it was, you know, a storm was forecasted or I heard thunder and then it might say the sky is cloudy or something like that. Right. Um, so anyway, so you get these logits that are for each of the, tokens you have, what's the nextly like token that will be generated. And from there, there's a bunch of different strategies to which token you pick. You may think like, oh, just pick the most, uh, the most likely one. And that's actually not always optimal. You kind of end up in like local minimas there. Um, so there's this, if, if you've played with some of the like APIs for these services, um, you'll think see things like temperature or top P or top K or whatever it may be, um, a lot of those sorts of parameters are tuning the process of how do I pick out of these probabilities what token it is? Because they don't always just pick the, the you know, don't do the greedy solution, right, of picking the the, the most likely token every time. Um, so there's some either randomization or shuffling or something that happens in there that helps, you, helps um, generate the next output of this, um, which why a lot of these, why if you prompt an LLM multiple times, you'll get different outputs. That's because there's this um, selection process that picks different tokens um, during during that, which changes the output, right? Um, so you'll see some APIs even have the ability to do things like they'll have a seed parameter um, or something along that line, which will let you sort of like fix the determinism of how that, um, of how you pick tokens, which will give you a deterministic output of if you put the same text in, you get the same output out. Um, if you keep your parameters all the same and give it at the same thick seed, otherwise it'll pick a random seed every time and stuff will change. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the, I think the high level takeaway from there is um, we'll talk about sort of two main use cases for these large language models. One is text generation here, which probably everyone's heard of, and also the um, ability to just co compute an embedding uh, vector, which then you can do similarity search with. Those are the two use cases. And these are sort of I think a good way from a practitioner's perspective to sort of view how these models will work. Um, there's a lot more detail that I'm definitely not the most qualified person to talk through, but those links that I referenced earlier would be really great resources if you want to dig down deeper and learn more. Uh, yeah. Cool. So I'm going to switch gears and we're going to talk about um, who is Red Panda? Because obviously I'm from Red Panda. I, I work there. It's a great place. And um, but like, why are we talking about um, these LLMs and Gen AI stuff today? And um, I'm just going to introduce you who who Red Panda is first. So um, first of all, Red Panda is a high performance data streaming engine. So we speak the Apache Kafka API. So if you have a Kafka client and there's one in basically every language, um, you can uh, talk and produce and consume messages um, from logs, uh, distributed logs. Um, and each of these logs are files are grouped, um, are, are segmented in two ways, topics and partitions. Um, so each partition is a log in the cluster. Uh, and there, there can be tens of thousands of logs per cluster. And each partition is a raft group, which normally is about three members, but sometimes it's five, sometimes it's seven, depending on your availability uh, and like you may want to tune your replication factor for various different means. And those partitions um, I uh, mentioned is, are organized by topics. So you can sort of, you have a topic, they have a number of partitions, and each of those partitions is a log file um, that you can append to by producing messages and you can consume from the from some point in the log to the end. Um, and there's other functionality in there like uh, you can checkpoint to at what point in the log you've consumed up to, you can distribute partitions of a topic uh, amongst multiple consumers. Um, yeah, those are some of the features. And the nice thing about Red Panda compared to other uh, Apache Kafka API compatible systems, um, it's really very high performance written in C++. Um, and we embrace sort of leading and um, cutting edge software um, 
new features in the Linux kernel to do completely async IO. Um, and we do other like performance techniques to really like eat the most performance we can out of machines, like avoiding virtual memory and um, other techniques like that. We also, it's also super easy to use. So it's deployed and managed as a single binary. So if you're like old school way of deploying is you just copy a, a binary to a bunch of machines and start them, like that'll work. Um, and obviously we're also very cloud native and friendly in terms of running stuff on Kubernetes. So that's my little spiel of who Red Panda is. Um, another important thing for the demos later is um, Red Panda Connect. So Red Panda Connect is a really awesome tool that you can use to build these stateless data pipelines um, via just a sim simple YAML file. Um, the nice thing about this is you can build these different, you have an input, you have a number of processors that you do on the data, and then you have an output is a uh, red, is it is one of these, what these data pipelines have. And you just sort of swap out the processing you want to do and the inputs and outputs that you want to receive and send to. And Connect is the framework that will handle all the failure modes. Um, make sure you get at least once delivery, handles back pressure, and all these like sort of like complicated retries and things that you'd want to do um, can be handled by the framework. And you don't have to write a line of code for all of it. Um, sticking to sort of our... our um, story of super easy to deploy and use. Um, it's just a single Go binary that you can copy over to a machine and run, super easy. And it's um, great and you're able to extend it as well. So if you have custom plugins, say, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day who wanted to like stream video frames through um, Red Panda Connect, you may, they wanted to add in a G streamer uh, input to be able to receive real-time video frames, do some processing on them and output the like semantic events that were happening um in a pipeline so um and, and that's pretty straightforward to do there's great examples for it that we have um and i wanted to oh there we go um give an example of what these pipelines look like from that yaml file that i talked about so there's this input um there's the pipelines which do some processing and then there's an output so in this specific example here that you're seeing we have an s3 input so it's reading from s3 and it's reading a bunch of every S, uh, C, uh, CSV file in this bucket. It's going to read them all, send them through the pipeline, and the output's going to go to a Kafka compatible message broker like Red Panda into the My Topic um, field. So uh, this step in between here, this processing processor, uh, is doing a mapping of the message. So it's uh, you're seeing here some some statements here. This is an embedded language within Red Panda Connect called Bloblang. It's really great. Um, it's a really easy way to just sort of like do really simple data manip manipulation. That if you maybe you have another step in here that you want to, you know, it's foreshadowing, but send that model, uh, send that data to a AI model, a Gen AI model to do some sort of processing or task and send it back. You may use a Bloblang expression to sort of like pluck what part of the message out you want to do. Or if you want to send it, um, to some API to enrich it or, you know, on and on and on. There's dozens and dozens of different processors that you can do things like caching and windowing and all sorts of like sliding and tumbling windows that you'd want to do and, and potentially in a data pipeline. You can all do that here in Connect in these processors as well. Uh, cool. So that's my example of a pipeline. Um, so I've been talking for a while. I want to kind of take a, take a break Make sure you're all awake here, especially if you're on the West Coast and it's early for you and ask a poll question. Um, so just where are you at in your data streaming adoption? Are you using data streaming today? Are you just here for the Gen AI? Are you, um, are you a streaming person that wants to know a little bit more about it? Um, Gen AI? Are you familiar with Red Panda at all? Have you ever used it? Um, anyways, yeah. Give you a second to vote and put that poll question in. Thank you in advance. I'll just wait for those to come in. Cool. Looks like uh, we're getting some good responses. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So now on to uh, the title of the stock, Sovereign AI. So Sovereign AI is Red Panda's vision for how data pipelines are built using this Gen AI technology and really AI in general. Um, so what we see, you know, at, a lot of these proprietary top-notch models are all built using these hosted APIs. And in order to do any sort of processing with those, you have to send your data across the public internet to these um, different providers. 
And for our customer base, which is a lot of the Fortune 500 and and these big enterprise companies, is they cannot send their data. Uh, that is like their IP, their their data is the most important thing that they safeguard for, whether that's on behalf of their users, whether it's the world, you know, some of the world's largest banks um, or high frequency trading information, like all of that information that they have is very, pro like very sensitive and the, one of their company's most valuable assets. So they can't just send that over the public internet. Um, and also in data streaming pipelines, the volume of data that comes through is super high generally. Uh, and it's it's fine if you're just experimenting and doing something small, you can send some data across the public internet. But as you get into these large volumes that we see in Red Panda, people processing, you know, over 10 gigabytes a second uh, in a cluster, like you just, you're not going to send all that data over the public internet. It's going to be way too costly. Um, and then if you need to do these sorts of processing again, you have to write these scripts. They have to handle, you know, sending this over the public internet, retrying and managing multiple things in flight because you need to get good parallelism and batching and et cetera and handling delivery guarantees. It just becomes a lot of work. And the entry bar to actually building technology, like building and adding value to your business with Gen AI becomes very high. Um, another insight for us uh, is that we've seen recently is the sort of, I don't know if I'll call it breakthrough or catching up of these open source models. They're super competitive with even the most powerful uh, proprietary models that are out on the market today. And they can be run yourself. You can fine tune them on your own hardware, deploy them on your own hardware um, and completely manage the life cycle and the data of, of how, the, how those get processed, how the data that goes in and out of that gets processed. Um, so I have an example here on the right of Llama 3.1. It's 400 uh, billion parameter model and some evaluations that they did against um, various different proprietary closed source models. And you can see it's very competitive with them. Um, in some cases, maybe even slightly better, um, depending on sort of, yeah, what, what you're looking at. But it's it's um, really amazing that this stuff is being open sourced and just anybody can download and use these um, models that, you know, take, I don't know how much money, lots of money to build and train and deploy. Uh, but now you can deploy them yourselves, um, ourselves, and we have them available. And also what we see is this the not only these big models are really cool, but just the the smaller models that can run even locally on a on a phone or on a laptop. Um, like the sort of like price per, uh price quality um uh curve, you you could say of those small models has really like risen up and to the right of like still being cheap to run these small models, but the quality has gotten drastically better. Um and we see a lot of like really great. Um, usage of those small models that uh, are fine-tuned to do exactly your tasks that you want um, to be very powerful. Um, I think I read a blog post the other day about um, how Meta was using the eight parameter Loma 2, I think, to do some root cause analysis of incidents and things like that. And it was just really fascinating to know that they're using like one of the smaller models um, for one of these really fairly complex tasks like triaging root cause analysis and very big software systems. Um, so anyways, uh, what we see as the future for these AI models is not sending the data to the model that's hosted somewhere else, it's actually bringing the model into the data itself um, so that it's local to the data and you don't have to send your data out anywhere. Your data never leaves your, your VPC. You can experiment and use whatever private data you have because you don't have to worry about getting sign off or anonymizing data or whatever you need to do to actually like get data out to a different provider. You can just experiment locally on your own laptop device of data you have access to um, and experiment with Gen AI. Um, and then also with Red Panda Connect, we've sort of been our execution front of like what it looks like to actually build data pipelines using Gen AI. Um, and just a few lines of YAML. So I'm going to demo some of those coming up here in a little bit. Um, but just in just to show some of the use cases and the really powerful, cool things you can do in just a few lines of YAML. Um, so again, we're just running those those open those open source models that are super powerful and you can do so much with. Running those locally on your own data in your own network. Um, that is Sovereign AI. So specifically, when using Red Panda Connect. 
Um, we see Sovereign AI in Red Panda Connect as a good uh, place to, like I said, as you're building these pipelines out, you can even, Red Panda Connect already supports using like OpenAI or um, Vertex or AI or Bedrock or these other like sorts of um, LLM providers that you can use, um, but you can also run things locally um, on the host device that's running uh, Red Panda Connect using Olama. And Olama has a huge swath of runtimes, uh, of models, excuse me. The Olama runtime has a huge swath of models that it supports everything from Llama 3.1, Quinn, Phi, uh, Gamma 2, whatever that may be. Also a bunch of different um, great embeddings models. And all of this, and it's really easy to swap out. Um, I don't know if I'll have an example, but uh, the delta between using Llama 3.1 for a task and uh, GPT-4.0 is like, three lines of YAML. You like swap, swap out a name of what component you're using and you swap out a model name. And that's, I think it, um, the, all the APIs for these um, Gen AI processors are very similar in structures so that you can kind of quickly experiment and swap, um, swap through them and see what the best is for your task. Um, and then, yeah, Red, Red Panda Connect is, lets you, you know, securely and uh, connects to all of these sorts of data sources that you may have in your, uh, enterprise, there may be lots of different ones um, and you can service and sort of use these different models in this sort of agnostic way. So you're not locked into a particular provider's APIs. Okay, so now we're going to go into the fun part, demo time. So I'm gonna share my terminal here and I'm gonna walk through two different examples. I have here Red Panda Connect that I've um, just built and have here running, and we're gonna walk through a number of different pipelines. So the first one I'm gonna walk you through is a data pipeline that is for uh, redaction of data. So this pipeline <coughs> is very simple. You can do a lot more with Red Panda Connect, but uh, I don't wanna overwhelm folks who are new to it. Um, so all this is gonna do is read some files from my local file system, process it using our Olama chat processor, and then send it out to standard out um, using just, yeah, just printing each output from the pipeline to standard out. And the actual pipeline itself, what it's doing here, there's this long prompt in here, you can see, and then we're, you can see here, we're forcing the output to be JSON and we're using Llama 3.170 billion. And that's gonna run locally on my GPU. And I'll show you when I run this, um, that it's actually doing that. So let me, um, start out by running redaction. There we go. So we're just going to run this local model and this is going to boot up. It's going to load this massive 70 billion parameter model. I don't even know how, um, quite how big the file is here, but it's been pulled down and loaded. And by the way, this Olama works, Olama works with, um, you can find tunes of models too. So if you have your own, you can deploy them to a Docker registry and pull them down and use them as well which is really cool, but you can see here, I have two GPUs running locally and it's loaded. You basically use all, in, all the VRAM that I have for them to be able to pull in this data. It loaded the model and then now it, it's printing the output. So what it did is it took an email that I had, it was a fake email that I generated and it ran it through this redaction um, prompt and, or excuse me, I gave it the LLM a task to redact information from the text and give me back the, the redacted text and additionally the replacements that you can do for um, to get back to the original data. So I asked it, I have this email about snoods that I got from Cozy Craft Snoods. And you can see there's these names here, like hi. I can here, I'll pull up here on the bottom the uh, original email so you can see what that looks like. Uh, there we go. So you can, you can see it's just it's replaced I'm name, you know, in the title at company with these square brackets. And then below it's giving me the replacements to get back to the original text of um, that. That was Mark Anderson, who's a sales director at Cozy Craft to actually give me back uh, that information. So super powerful um, that you can just a local model can do these sorts of uh, tasks on unstructured data. So one of the use cases that we really see um, people wanting to use these models for is for unstructured data pipelines. So a lot of these models even support multimodal support. So they can do things like C, C in some aspects, I guess of the word um, images, 
So you can take things like if you have PDFs that you need to process, instead of doing those by hand or doing some complicated like OCR process, you can just run those through uh, an LLM um, because a lot of these models work that way uh, or work and support um, images as well as, as text. So that is uh, the example of an unstructured data pipeline that's doing redaction. And then the other example I want to show you is uh, an example of similarity search. So this is one step away from RAG. Um, but what we have here is, if you're not familiar with RAG, Retrieval Augmented gener um, Generation, is what you have is you have this indexing side of things where you take your data source and you uh, run it through a model to compute embeddings for it. And then you put that into some database that works. So for this demo, we're, I'm going to use PG vector. So I'm just going to run locally a little uh, Postgres instance with PG vector enabled. And um, that's going to be my local sync for data. And if we look at this indexing pipeline, so this is like 37-ish lines of YAML. I'm going to pull data from <clears throat> Red Panda Cloud. So we I have a little serverless cluster. It's super easy to get up and running. It's like three clicks um, to create this. And I have here, I'm going to read from this live input uh, topic. And then um, I have, you know, sort of my security, um, my user and password and using SSL. Um, inside of this topic, is a series of Wikipedia articles. I think there's like five, I don't have a lot, but um, just wanted to show a small example. And what we're gonna do is we're going to take that data. So it's just a string. We're gonna use a little, like you said, these this blob lang embedded language within Red Panda Connect to sort of munge it. We're gonna move the data as a string and put it into this text field. We're gonna compute embeddings um, using a model called Nomic Embed Text. Nomic Embed Text has been trained for similarity search. So it has, it understands, it's, its training set has this concept of what is a search document versus what is a search query. Um, so we're telling the model that this is a search document that I want you to compute an embedding for. And then I give it, you know, this.txt, which is the munch data that I just used up here. And then the result of that, we're going to write into the embeddings field here uh, of, of the, uh, you can think of it as like sort of a JSON object that's coming through this pipeline. And then we're going to take the output of that and we're going to write it into my locally running Postgres. So I have Postgres here and then, you know, my connection string. There's also some fun things you can do, like some initialization SQL statements. So because I just booted up this random Docker container, it's going to, I'm going to create my extension for PG vector. I'm going to create a little simple table here that has a key and a value. And then and the value is going to be the vector. And then the body is going to be the actual original text that we created embeddings for. And we're going to create an index um, using hierarchical navigable small worlds, which is itself a own fascinating topic of these different vector indexes and how they work and how they make similarity search really fast, these approximate nearest neighbor indexes. Um, so anyway, I'm going to um, yeah, create an index on this table that uses the vector for, for that. And then we're also, we're all you can see here is that key body and value, we're going to use the Kafka key, which this is a way of referencing metadata. These pipelines have the actual payload that goes through and then a, a bunch of metadata that's associated with them. And Kafka key is the, the original Kafka key metadata that came from our input here. And then we also have our text that we're going to use as the body and then our embeddings vector as the value, um, which is which this vector function is what makes it a PG vector um, compatible data type that we can then insert into Postgres. OK, so that is our pipeline. And then, yeah, uh, just being able to do an upsert instead of just an insert. Um, and then the next phase of this, there's another um, component here to actually do similarity search. So believe it or not, in Red Panda Connect, one of the inputs you can have is an HTTP server. So you can actually write little HTTP servers um, in here as well. And what we're going to do is we have an HTTP server here that will service GET requests. And it's going to compute an embeddings, this time telling the model that this is a search query. And then run that through our embeddings uh, model, the same one, nomic embed text. And then we write our embeddings to that same object. And then we're going to do a SQL statement, uh, a query that will do similarity search to get the top matching document um, 
using that vector that we just computed from the initial input search query. This at Q is going to be a query parameter Q. So I'll show you how to query this um, in a second when we actually run this. Uh, and that's our full pipeline. The only, uh, and then the seek response is what tells us to, you can now respond back to the original um, HTTP request is what this processor step does. So the only other thing here to make this a um, full rag would be to then use the retrieve documents here from Postgres inside of a prompt that you would give to an LOM. Um, yeah, and then you could respond with that. So that is the two pipeline files. Now, Red Panda Connect has this really cool thing called streams mode um, that will let me run multiple pipelines in the same process. So that's what I'm going to do with this example. So I have Postgres running in the background. Um, I'm going to run this pipeline in streams mode. So I'm running both the indexing pipeline and that search HTTP server um, in a single process. So we're running that now and you can see it's sort of printing out the different phases of now, you know, we are starting to read stuff from, from Kafka. We've pulled down our embeddings um, model that we've loaded that it's now running. If I showed you in top, you'd see that it's using a little bit. These embeddings models are much smaller than the um, text generation models generally. So I'm using a little bit of my VRAM here for my GPU. And now if we look at PSQL and we um, let's see, count. You see, we have five records in our table now from our pipeline. And that's just um, the, I had five uh, Wikipedia articles that I put into my topic. So it's already pulled them down, computed the embeddings for, and put them in Postgres um, all in that pipeline. It's committed the results back uh, to our consumer group and Kafka. Um, like I said, all in that simple YAML file. If there were errors, we could add retries and things like that as well. So um, now that those are in there, we can, you, <clears throat> do a very simple search of our data um, and get simil do similarity search. So one of the articles in there happens to be about snoods, which is uh, sort of uh, a hat or I guess, uh, yeah, a hat you can wear. So if I search for something to keep my head warm, it will give me back results where the, the top matching result will be the snood instead of, I don't know what the other articles are, something, um, some other random Wikipedia articles that I have. So I'm gonna, um, I just queried that and I got back, see the body of, of that first paragraph of that Wikipedia article that I put into Red Panda of, um, yeah, of what the definition of that is. And, and it also responded with the original key uh, or the key from the table, which was the Kafka um, key as well. So that is an example of using Red Panda Connect to build similarity search, or you could build RAG with it as well um, in just a few lines of YAML. switch back to the presentation now. So there were my demos and thanks for joining. Uh, that's that's what I have to do. If you wanna learn more about Red Panda uh, and Sovereign AI specifically, you can go to ai.redpanda.com. If you want to ask me questions, um, there's a bunch of different socials um, or feel free to just email me directly. Um, would love to talk more about AI, about data streaming about the intersection of streaming and gen ai there's a lot of really cool use cases and things there um that yeah we've been seeing and working with customers to build so yeah i'm excited to see what y'all get to build with this technology and thanks for joining i think there's a couple of questions in the in the qa here so i'm going to look um somebody asked are the slides going to be available later sorry joined a few minutes like yeah no worries um yeah we can make the slides available somehow maybe we can send them out um i think there's an email that goes out afterwards that shows the recording at least so there will be a live recording you can walk you can kind of see the slides themselves i don't tend to make very text heavy so um but the recording will be live later so you can see that and rewatch um if there's parts that you've missed yeah. Okay. Let's see any other? Okay, I see a couple other questions here. Um, so, are there any performance trade offs when processing data locally to running models compared to traditional cloud based services? Um, totally. Um, I think one of the things about uh, running models locally is that you're you're in full control of the the scaling of these models and how they run them. Generally, um, these models are sort of like 
when you invoke them there, it's a sort of a stateless pattern, right? You give it some data, it gives you this data back. So it's very easy to scale out and horizontally. Um, and you get to control how much that is. So one thing that people love to talk about with Gen AI is costs. And um, I think with, with sovereign AI, it changes the equation of how you look at these things. It lets you think uh, of these as sort of a capacity based of like, how much do I want to pay? And then you can push as much data in these data pipelines through that capacity as you want. So you can really easily like look at budgets and things like that. instead of having some surprise after you've made a bunch of requests to some uh, provider. So, uh, and, and also performance wise, you can really pick what hardware you use and really optimize what makes best for your use case. Um, you can even run these sorts of things on-prem if your data is, is set is on-prem and you can't run things in the cloud. Um, that is also an option as well, because as you see this um, Red Panda Connect was super easy to get up and running with these models. And that runs, that's running here on a local machine that's like right next to me, that could run in your data center or in one of the hyper clouds. Um, it all, all works sort of the same. Great question. Uh, next question, what challenges should we anticipate when integrating sovereign AI with our current tech stack? Yeah, a lot of what we've seen from customers uh, from just like challenge points are just, how do I get data sources get data into these models to sort of experiment and, and provide value to my company. And I think the, um, I think that's where, where Red Panda Connect really helps you is that it, we have I think 220 over different uh, plugins for Red Panda Connect to different data sources. And you can connect to dozens and dozens of different data sources. So it's very easy to just in a few lines of YAML, start processing, pulling data down. You just point it at whatever your data is stored in, whether that's Postgres or in S3 or in OpenSearch or Elasticsearch or you know whatever it may be. Um, and yeah, and you, if you want to get that into a uh, embeddings database, you know we support uh, PG Vector and Postgres, like you saw in this demo, but also we support uh, Pinecone, Quadrant, and a few other like vector databases that specialize in vector search as well. Um, okay, and let's see, we have another question here. What are some of the real world examples of real time RAG where Red can Panda can be the central component? Um, so Red Panda, the message broker itself, uh, I think is a really great buffer for, like I said, you want to sort of have this fixed capacity or how much you're willing to spend on these models in sovereign AI and your data flow of data may um, be different than what that capacity is, right? So having Red Panda in front of that as a message broker and sort of as a buffer um, for your indexing pipeline is a super powerful use case um, that we see lots of customers doing. And oftentimes you already have a message broker in your enterprise um, that is the hub for all data flow for, for the company and being able to just hook into that really easily using connect. Um, and then, yeah, using that as sort of the uh, indexing pipeline is something we've seen really, really popular as well. There's a few use cases as well as having it sort of be the um, buffer for the search side of things as well. Um, where if you have, if you're already in this streaming paradigm and you have some data you wanna augment or enrich with using an LLM, you may need to use uh, RAG or fetch some additional contextual data to perform that enrichment and having a RAG pipeline that you know reads that reads the data from your your message broker from Red Panda, enriches it in whatever way you need, and then send it back into Red Panda for whatever downstream systems want to uh, contain that. Like enrichment is a very common use case that we see um, for in these sort of data pipelines, and that Red Panda being a central component for that. So I think. Both sides, you can have a central component. A lot of times, I think when we think of RAG, we think of the sort of standard request response paradigm um, that you would see in like a, a web application or something like that. And while that is a good use case and is very popular and and um, for, for Red Panda specifically, I think that's a good place. Um, it, it has value in those data pipelines from the, the query side um, where it just like seems like a no brainer to me from the indexing side of things just to like provide that buffer before you start to actually index data and throw and, and compute the embeddings. Yeah, great, great, uh, great question. Okay, uh, let's see, last last question to, uh, that I see here so far. Um, to what extent can we customize and fine tune AI models with sovereign AI to meet our specific business needs? Yeah, totally, you can definitely customize the models and fine tune them uh, with the Olama processors, or if you're using 
Um, we support, you know, Vertex AI and um, OpenAI API compatible services and um, Amazon Bedrock. So if you fine tune a model at any of those services, you can use them using the AP, the standard API connectors. Um, or like I said, with the OpenAI compatible um, interface, there's tool, there's, there's projects out there like VLLM, which is like a run to, uh, LLM uh, runtime that pulls arbitrary models down from Hugging Face. And if you can, if you have something that's on Hugging Face or you want to take something from Hugging Face and do a little bit of fine tuning on it and then um, use that in an inference pipeline using VLM, you can do that. And then Red Panda Connects can be that glue piece that connects all of your data flowing through to um, VLLM uh, and allows you to build enrichment or do these sorts of different use cases that we've talked through. So you can definitely, and even Olama itself is, the cool thing about Olama is it's a Docker-based um, API and service. So when it pulls down models, it's using the Docker protocol. So it's it's there's a format for saving these using the Olama tool and putting them into a, uh, a container registry. So if you have a container registry already available, which I think a lot of companies do these days, um, where you're storing a, uh, code artifacts, you can also store your fine-tuned models in there and, and upload them and download them using um, Olama and the Red Panda Connect processor for that supports um, pulling down those custom models as well. So yeah, great question. Cool. Uh, I think that's all the questions I see here live now. If you're watching this later, or if you think of something, I always think of stuff after the fact. Um, like I said, I have all of my contact information here. Feel free to reach out on any social channel or just email me. Our community Slack is also a great resource um, for people. If I'm not around, you'll get a faster response than probably just me um, for, for Red Panda. So yeah, thank you again for joining and feel free to um, yeah ask any questions after the fact. Happy Tuesday, everyone. Thank you so much, Tyler, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.